In our survey also, we've tried to gauge whether religious or non-religious people is as much difference. Very little difference on those attitudes to what counts a family. You might think religious people would be more conservative, oriented to the narrower biological definition. No, they're not. There's very little difference, actually. I just gave you one example. So if we take, if we say the narrowest view of the family is the biological, opening up to the person close, broad view, what, what predicts the views, the narrow views? Here are the most important things, most important correlations from our survey. So older conservative men are the ones who have the narrowest definition of the family. But when it comes to children and parenting of children, people go back to the, bio, to the view that it's best to have uh, two parents and preferably a mother and a father. So quite quite strong levels, thinking it, high levels think it's bad for single women to have children without a male partner. Only 21% of people think churches welcome lesbian, gay people. Uh, they think the churches are really very focused around traditional families. But actually, the Christians we surveyed are much more open-minded about a family than their churches are. I have to put my little plug in here about Christianity. Ronald's going to say, to say more. Christianity is very ambivalent about the family. Here's a very famous quotation from Jesus. Who is, my fam who is my family? Well, it's those who do the will of God. It's not the biological family. Uh, and here's Peter Brown summing up early Christianity's hostility to sexuality and the family. This aspect of humanity would be washed away in the true Christian life and in the resurrection. We forget that strong emphasis on celibacy and monasticism. And Christianity uses all these terms for what's really a family. The Pope is a real father, the priest is a father, abbots, mothers, sisters, godparents. Christianity actually has an incredibly broad view of what the family is. None of these are actually biological. Right from the scriptures themselves and through the early church, Christianity ambiguously prized both celibacy and marriage. Different statements, but also different people, different times. As the years went on, Catholicism tended to regard celibacy as an ideal state and Protestantism marriage as an ideal state. But what all these denominations had in common was a quite unprecedented hostility to sex outside marriage of any kind, but over the years increasingly towards gay, lesbian, bisexual unions. This was not the case in the ancient world. And the result of this is that at the present day, with family alliances of all kinds under the pressures I've described, which are enormous, Christian morality has become a lot harder to make a fit than before. If you're marrying somebody for life and it means decades, almost certainly rather than a few years, it's a whole different deal. And likewise, if you have the abilities that people have to meet new partners of all different types, and sex drives out of all proportion to those Charles species has had until the 20th century. On the other hand, the fact that Christian morality is a lot harder to fit the reality now may make it all the more admirable and strenuous and praiseworthy as an ideal to which certain people would wish to live up, and perhaps should they wish to hold up to others as an ideal. But perhaps others might say that the older, more secular, more pragmatic, more practical, ancient way of looking at sex and marriage might be a handy, more flexible model to which to return if we're going to bother with faith at all. We've just seen that fascinating poll showing how tolerant people have become, how, how very flexible in their attitudes to what is a family, uh, and, and understanding of how complex the modern world has become. Nevertheless, uh, plenty of other polls show us that the romantic idea remains pretty strongly embedded in most people, young people starting out in life. What is your ideal? Your ideal is that you will meet your perfect partner, that you will get married probably, though the bit of paper may matter less. You will stay together for life, you will have children, you will love your partner forever, who will love you forever, and your children miraculously will love you forever too. <laughs> and that, is, that remains the ideal. I think every politician praises the family, but the important question in the end is, 
let's be realistic about what the state can and can't do to support families. It can't change uh, social and moral attitudes and values. They happen despite the state. The state came along with divorce laws to sweep up after people had already walked away from marriage with their feet themselves. Uh, but the state can do the best it can to support families wherever they are and whatever shape they are. And I think traditional families point to certain constraints, certain givens. We are embedded in some involuntary relationships. Most basically, we don't choose who our own parents are. Uh, they're gene shapers in all sorts of ways. We are given certain relationships in family. It's not just a matter of choosing them. But it's also rooted in making choices, making important decisions to commit to other people. And as social creatures, our learning to become social creatures and flourish in society begins as children, and in that the family is the most formative structure uh, in learning to be social beings. And so the pattern of family life is vitally important, I think, in shaping wider society. And the traditional family, in theory and often in practice, provides a structure which stresses the importance of continuity, commitment, security, stability, love and sacrifice for the good of others. So I think is a second reason about an understanding of how we flourish best as human beings. But there's also a fundamental concern for the weak and the vulnerable. And any society that applies to children, many societies, sadly, it also applies to women, applies also to the elderly. We can think in terms of older generations within the family. And Jesus' attitudes to both children and women were radically humanizing. And the question then is what structures offer the best environment for the weakest? And I think there's much evidence that the traditional family uh, works best. My view is that that debate about whether it's good or whether it's bad, it actually is confusing. Uh, changing form, changing family types, with changing meaning, actually the content of people's lives. And it, that debate just ignores how people understand their family lives and it assumes that change in family form is the same as change in the substance of people's lives. So instead, um, my own and, and uh, lots of other people's research shows that you actually haven't got that, any of these simple messages for good or for bad. It's quite a complex picture of change and continuity, and also <coughs> change as continuity, which I'll try to explain what I mean. It's very clear that most people still value family life. Um, they want to do the right thing by each other. They want to put their children first. They're looking for long-term relationships, and they value commitment. But those commitments don't always take the form of what we think of as a traditional family. Having, but just because it doesn't take that form, it doesn't mean to say that we're all acting as these sort of individualistic, self-centered people. People do think about whether their actions are the right thing to do whether they're morally right in a particular context. So they do agonise over it. Um, and so sort of that focus on, on, being, on commitment and on doing the right thing, I think you could call that as sort of the wine of old family content, if you like, in the bottles of new family forms. Like most parts of this debate, it's a recent arrival to think that the state can solve most problems, or, or indeed many problems. Uh, in ancient times, because marriage was a civil contract, the state would be called in if somebody shouted it was being unfairly broken, but otherwise leave it alone completely. Uh, in the Christian centuries, the state tended to follow Christian morality as the established church provided it, so we're in a new situation. What we don't want to have is what actually happened around 1980, when top politicians articulated a history of the family that was utterly and completely wrong, totally bogus, saying that the family was decomposing because of the welfare state, because traditionally parents provided for their own parents in old age, disciplined their children, etc., etc. And it's because the family is not being propped up by the state and the escape route's not blocked off that we're now having to shell out so much. But I'd like to turn back to you, Andrew, because... Uh, faith is part of the badging of this debate. Mm. And one of the reasons why we're all getting on so well on the whole is that we're actually talking, consciously or not, in totally secular terms. Inclu including yourself, even though you're based in scripture, you're using pragmatic arguments. Could I ask, are you actually saying that your view of the family is articulated as a personal viewpoint and it's up to people whether or not they accept it and that's really not a great issue? 
Or do terms like sin and damnation still have any purchase on this for you when determining the consequences of people's behaviour? Um, yeah, I'm happy to use the language of sin in terms of working out what is good for human flourishing and what is not good for human flourishing, or what is in conformity with what God has revealed and what is not. So I'm not sure it helps in a general discussion on the family. And I think, you know, I, I am using statistical evidence because I think we need to look at that. I was also talking about how my understanding does come out of my understanding of who God is and the revelation that we have in Christ and in the scriptures. So I think that it's not an either or between the two. I think I want to commend what I believe, explain what I believe it which has got a basis in my faith which some here will share and some won't but also to say that you know some of the evidence about the relative stability of children in cohabiting couples compared to married couples or whatever we also need to put into the discussion which you know we don't have a faith view on that one way or the other we need to look at the evidence and look at the research that has been done on that well, you're, you're, all being awfully, Linda. you're being awfully positive about the traditional family. It, family is terrible. Families are where the most awful things happen. Most people get murdered in them. Um, <laughs> most child abuse happens in them. And if we just narrow everything down to the family is the only place for children, if we're actually thinking about children as welfare, that kind of narrowing of society to think that children can only grow up in a family and there's no escape is actually really quite dangerous. Well, I'm not sure the things that you're ascribing are necessarily to do with whether it's a traditional family or not. It's what happens in the household. But if you think and that, that may be a household. children have to only be in the family and they can't escape to relatives, grandparents, other sorts of community. There used to be more range. Now we're so determined that you've got to be in that unit and that's the only way to bring up children. You're, you're defining family there in the narrow nuclear sense, because obviously you've talked about other relatives. You know, I think I would want to have a more expansive view of family and encourage us to have that and to see family as connected to other networks of community. It's not just an isolated small unit. It has to be connected into other communities as well. Um, that's, you know, it is, it is mm. part of a wider network. I thought you said something really interesting about the Christian belief. There was, uh, there was Christ who said, this is, this is my family, his chosen family. Um, the, 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 um, uh, you know, he, his friends, his community, not his mother and brothers waiting outside mm. the door. And you said something which I thought was very important and, and is very rarely said because it's a dangerous thing to say, that actually the family may not be the be-all and end-all. It's a danger of becoming an idol in itself. And these days, you often hear people very self-righteously uh, a, 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 justifying selfishness, yep. I'm doing it for mm. my family. Sure whatever I do, mm. I'm getting the money, I'm mm. not paying my taxes, and whatever, I'm doing it for my mm. family. Uh, putting up the fortress around the family as a way of not thinking mm. about what's for the good of the wider society. And everybody says, oh yes, of course, he's very, a very good family man, or they're doing it for their family, as if that were a justification. And I'd forgotten mm. that Christian element that mm. says that maybe it's not. And that's the basis of priestly celibacy that you can do good for lots yeah. of people in society, but you can't if you're focusing on your family. Mm. It's actually a form of selfishness. William Joseph. Uh, concerning state involvement, it can do it in two ways. It can either react to change of the family attitude and it can also try to engineer it. Uh, do you think the state should really get involved in engineering uh, the social attitude toward marriage, for example, uh, refusing to legalize same-sex marriage, is that really a, an attempt to engineer? Some people actually want the state to socially engineer, to change people's minds and attitudes and views uh, and the way they behave. I think that's very difficult. But the state is involved willy-nilly because it has to decide how to apportion taxes. It has to decide how to apportion benefits. It has to decide, you know, on civil partnerships was a big change in tax law and in inheritance law. Um, those things uh, are in the state's domain. So the state can't stay totally neutral. It can try its best uh, to say all we're trying to do is adapt ourselves to where people seem to be moving. And I think that's what it should do. I think it has a real and prime duty to children, though. And I think that you know, the last government, government thought of its social policy <coughs> almost entirely in terms of children. And I think that leads you in the right direction of what to do about the family, because you're saying wherever children are, we have to make things 
as good for them as possible, remove obstacles as much as we possibly can, make it as likely as possible that they will flourish. I also wanted to say something about uh, same-sex couples, just because it's another illustration of my point that actually um, the re latest research that's been done on, on uh, young same-sex couples who are entering into civil partnerships and is that the majority of them talk about it as marriage. Everyone refers to it as marriage, although it's not. But actually what, what they, uh, young couples say that they're doing when they're, uh, is that they want to express this long-term commitment. Um, and they've got very similar ideals and hopes to heterosexual couples getting married, you know, about love and romance and the challenges and rewards of being together and so on and, and valuable. So, so again, I would say it's just, it's the, those, those values are still there. But one thing that does bring them all together and we haven't spoken about is the way story brings all of these things together as family. If we share the story with each other, then we're part of each other. And the, the word that I haven't heard anybody <coughs> express yet is respect. Mm -hmm. And yet I heard, I hear in the playgrounds at, uh, at school, this thing about where respect is. And I, I wonder if that's something. Is there a breakdown of respect which is breaking down other things? I want to look at respect and romance, that wonderful partnership that lies at the basis of so much of this. Uh, we may be in a difficult position at present because of uh, social change. We're also in a rather tough position because of, we're a species that, unlike most animals, doesn't have seasonal mating. We can mate all the time. And we are neither a species that tends naturally to make long, unbreakable unions, nor are we a species that is naturally more promiscuous. We actually produce, produce both patterns. And that's why ever since records began, the ideal of falling in love and staying in love until death do part is the human ideal. It's what we'd actually like to do if we are interested in romance and do want to make partnerships. But the framework you place around this need can be very different. And that there are three, basically, that have existed through time. Uh, the first is to, it's a matter for the individual people to make it work emotionally and practically, maybe with the help of friends or relations. Number two is that it's a, a civil contract with the state or the city or the province, and they owe something back to the wider community for having said something official and getting privileges in return. And number three is that it's a contract with a deity, with the divine, uh, on certain lines that the divine has prescribed. And if you break those, then you may bring about the end of the world rather fast here, and you're almost certainly going to have a rather dicey fate in the afterlife, mm -hmm. if you get an afterlife. And our problem now is those three languages are hopelessly intermingled. My question really is about, I think it's important that we do talk about the good, that we do talk about um, the best, but how do we do it in a way that includes people rather than excludes them? I do think we do have, I mean, I don't put it in any kind of religious context. I put it in a social context. I do think we all are born with ideals of all different kinds. We think society should be fairer than it is. We think we should be better than we are. We think in all sorts of ways. We should be more moral, if you like. Because I think that is imprinted on us. I think it's what makes us social animals. It's what makes, makes us communitarian spirited in lots of ways. But it means that we are always living with the guilt of falling away from what we know we should be and should do. And that's part of the human condition. But I agree that as a society, it is really important that we don't judge people according to the kinds of families that they end up living in and bringing their children up in. The thing that occurs to me is maybe spending this enormous sum of money is an attempt to um, re-sacralise the marriage bond in a, in a kind of largely post-Christian society. You're doing something absolutely gratuitous that makes no sense whatever, <laughs> spending £20,000. And as such, it has much of the qualities of a, of a, of a, of a sacrifice. <laughs> um, is, this a, is this a sensible idea? The meaning of marriage has ch the words stayed the same, but the meaning of it, uh, its symbol symbolic meaning, has changed. So previously, it was you, you got married in a church or religious uh, uh, place, and uh, it was a public statement in that sense. It then shifted in the 60s into actually it was a private thing, 
and couples went off and they could get married for £100. Um, and then it has now shifted to becoming much more of a public statement. But it's not a public statement of commitment in, in the religious sense. It's a, 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 a two people. It's a public statement. We've made it. We've got this far and we can have this big public celebration. The great value of some kind of ceremony of union is that traditionally in our society, for a long time, marriage rights have taken the place of other rights of coming of age, like puberty rights in other societies, that are a way of demonstrating we've reached a certain level of maturity and are going on to another phase of existence. And as such, they're awfully symbolically important. But follow the money also. Of those three models I propose, attraction's at the basis of one, which is couples coming together. A mixture of theology and concern about uh, pollution and the limits to right behaviour is at another, the religious. And in between, the whole state thing, the whole contract thing, is about cash. There are two things happening at once. The first is couples being able to support a family and each other when they get together. It's got to work economically. And a huge amount of law and rules and attitudes have been built around that. And the other is something we're increasingly losing, which is the dowry. That when you get hitched, traditionally your parents give you cash or inheritance. And that's why families are regulated even in societies that do not care too much about the inviolability of the contract. They care desperately about whether the children can be positively recognised mm -hmm. as having come from those people. And therefore whether they can inherit property passed down through line. It's actually doing something that sort of is a, as a conscious decision to, to fix a life together, so buying a house or even just getting a pet. Uh, and that joint corporate decision that we have a future together and this is shown in this way, whereas obviously a baby may just arrive without being planned um, and you might just move in together without having a conscious decision. This is a commitment that is really long-term, perhaps even lifelong. And so there is some research being done as to what are the things within non-marital relationships that are pointers to them having the sense of stability and continuity, maybe more more akin to what has traditionally been associated with marriage. I just think all this shows really that the, the happy, stable, long-lived traditional family is a fantasy and it's appropriate we should have a kind of fantasy wedding thing to celebrate this fantasy and make it more and more fantastical and maybe this ideal is just so adrift from the reality of most people's lives we'd be better discarding it.